Hello there. I hope you all are having a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining me tonight as we talk once again about Lucy. Yeah, so tonight we're going to be talking about Lucy. She's the most famous Australopithecus fossil ever found, and we're going to be specifically focusing in on the question, is this particular skeleton a mixture of bones that come from humans and those that come from another sort of arboreal creature? Or is this actually one particular individual? So that's the question that we're going to be addressing this evening. So once again, thanks to everyone joining in. Uh, yeah. So why don't we get into things? Is Lucy a chimera? So first of all, maybe we should address exactly who Lucy is. This is a picture of Lucy. Um, she is the most well-known fossil hominid ever discovered, and she was discovered by uh, Donald Johansson. And you can see on the left there a picture of her skeletal remains. And we have quite a bit of her skeleton, which allows us to understand quite a bit about uh, development, uh, size, uh, basically limb proportions, uh, lets us know about birthing in Australopithecines quite a bit there to understand and learn about from such a nice skeleton as that. Sometimes I hear people talk about how Lucy is so incomplete, but what sometimes people don't realize is that we don't really need a complete skeleton to really address all of the questions that we want because there's something called bilateral symmetry, and that is every bone on the left side of your body looks basically exactly like the one on the right side of your body. And so even when we have a skeleton which is missing limb bones for example from one side of the body we can just basically understand what those look like from studying the other side and so really you know a 50 percent complete skeleton is really a full skeleton to people who are studying a fossil like this and so really you know even small bone fragments can be very informative about a a skeleton so our question tonight is, is Lucy a chimera? So what exactly is a chimera? Um, well, come on, chimera is actually comes from ancient Greek. It's this crazy thing. I, I have a picture of it there for you. I can't remember exactly how old that sculpture is. I think it's like from 300 BC, if I'm thinking correctly. But basically, the idea is that a chimera is this mythical creature, which is this mash of all these different animals put together. It has like the head of a lion, it has like a goat head coming out of its back, and its tail is like a snake, and it has like spikes along its back. And the point is that they were just coming up with this creature that was a mishmash of all of these different animals put together in one. Well, in paleontology, the term is used in a similar manner. We refer to a chimera as an individual fossil that has all of these different parts from different creatures put together together. And people are acting as if it's one single individual. And we've had all sorts of examples of like this, with, for example, Brachiosaurus before, where they would put, you know, the wrong head and then they basically were making a composite creature. And we've had lots of different cases of this in paleontology before. So specifically, what we want to talk about is whether or not we could detect if the Lucy skeleton is a mixture of of different types of animal bones, right? So typically, this has been something that has not really been held in mainstream paleoanthropology. Mostly young earth creationists have argued this, and they seem to, well, let's follow their thought processes. So typically, from a young earth creationist perspective, the Australopithecines that we know about, um, like, for example, you know, the Tong child or some other Australopithecines, they were not bipedal. That is, they weren't walking on their hind legs. And the issue there comes to when you have a nice skeleton like Lucy's or like Littlefoot's, for example. The problem there is that we have this skull morphology that everybody's willing to accept is that of a non-human. But then when we come to that cranial morphology together with the postcranium, suddenly that becomes a problem for those who want to say that non-humans couldn't walk upright. And so they need an explanation. And in the case of Lucy, the explanation for some has become, well, we have here a skull and perhaps an upper body, 
that comes from a non-human, some type of arboreal ape. And then we have the pelvis and the leg bones and the toe bones, perhaps, that come from a human, right? And so trying to basically divvy up the skeleton into parts where you can still try to act as if the Australopithecines weren't walking upright. And people, this, people have held views about Littlefoot like that for a long time. Or, or sorry, Lucy. Littlefoot is a little more of a challenge because for Littlefoot, we actually have a partial articulation, right? We have all of the remains in a very, very tight area and not like Lucy just scattered on the surface. We have them actually in situ, right? And so that then is really the biggest challenge to people. And really, honestly, I haven't seen a lot of creationists who disagree with the Australopithecines walking upright try to deal with Littlefoot probably because of that fact, because if there is such close association, it's really impossible to try to explain this away as different creatures getting mixed up together. So Lucy here, uh, a little bit about her discovery. Donald Johansson, as I mentioned before, discovered her bones in 1974, and it was at this site called Hadar in the Afar region of Ethiopia. A lot of other Australopithecus afarensis fossils have also come from Hadar, uh, like the Katanumu skeleton, which we'll, we'll see a little later on. And also, I believe the a juvenile Salam was also found at the site. And there's been a ton of other individuals that were more fragmentary as well. So one thing that a lot of people who I talk to don't actually know about the Lucy fossil site is that all of Lucy's bones were recovered in an area that was three square meters. So that's roughly about nine square feet, which to me, when I learned that was actually pretty astonishing because a lot of times we would find fossils over a larger area than that, even if they do come from a single individual. And really this is pretty astonishing, at least to me, that we could find all of her bones right together in such a small area. I've gone out in the field collecting fossils before and I found fossils, you know, eroding out of a hillside, and you will find them scattered over quite a large area. And we do know that Lucy's bones came out of uh, an eroding hillside, but it wasn't a very steep hillside. And so nine square meters is really a pretty small area in which to find, you know, a whole skeleton. I mean, just thinking taphonomically about how things are preserved, right, I've gone out in the woods and seen deer skeletons, for example, that coyotes have preyed on. And you'll find parts all scattered around in like a hundred foot radius or larger, right? So the fact that we have all of the bones of Lucy's skeleton coming from this small of an area is actually in itself pretty good evidence that Lucy's bones all belong to a single individual. Now, one of the kind of primary young earth creationists who would promote this view is Christopher Rupi, uh, who is the main author of this book, Contested Bones, and then uh, Dr. John Sanford as well. And in their book, they don't really actually go into a whole lot of detail on this specifically, um, but you can see here, here's a quote from the book. Could the Lucy skeleton contain bones that do not belong to the same individual, or more importantly, the same species? This is not unreasonable. Lucy's skeleton was found in a mixed bone bed consisting of all types of African fauna, including primates such as monkeys and baboons. And this is kind of their approach to ask questions like this rather than uh, making a definitive assessment of this particular uh, skeleton, right? And so really in the book, they don't really come out very strongly exactly what their views on this particular skeleton are. Generally, Rupi and Sanford do take the position that Australopithecus afarensis as a whole species is chimeric. Uh, that is, there's different individuals from all different uh, species that make up this one supposed species. But on this particular matter of, of the Lucy skeleton in particular, they don't really take a lot of strong opinions, though it is pretty important for their case that they would deny that this is indeed uh, a single individual here. So way back in the earliest description of the Lucy fossil, it's referred to as AL288-1, if anyone's wondering, there was one particular note which not a lot of people thought about. And 
here's the quote here that came from that original paper, the original description of the Lucy fossil. Uh, Johansson wrote, the state of preservation of this specimen is quite unusual. He was talking about a small fragment of a thoracic vertebrae that I have pictured there inside that box. And he said, it appears polished or even water-worn and is the only specimen from AL288-1, Lucy, to display these characters. They will make interpretation of casts difficult. So this is interesting, right, that we have, as Johansson was describing Lucy Skelton for the first time, he pointed out that there was something unique about one particular bone out of all of the bones he discovered. And it was that this fragment here of this thoracic vertebrae had a polished surface to it. It's very smooth compared to the other bones that will have more uh, particular detail uh, from the bone on them, right? And so this is really interesting, but it wasn't really talked about very much for quite a long time. I think about 40 years or so, it was just kind of generally accepted that this particular bone did belong in the Lucy skeleton, despite these particular uh, unique characteristics that it had. And then that changed uh, when this paper was published, Lucy's back reassessment of fossils associated with the AL288-1 vertebral column. And so basically what this study did was they noticed there was something peculiar about this particular thoracic vertebrae. And it wasn't just that it was worn down and smooth compared to the rest. So let me show you a little bit of how exactly they worked through that this vertebrae did not belong to the Lucy skeleton. So one, uh, here is a, uh, a diagram from their uh, paper. You can see geometric mean derived from six dimensions from the pars interarticularis and articular facet. Basically, what they're measuring here is these facets within the vertebrae, and they're doing it at all of these different uh, levels. Okay, so you see the the uh, the axis along the bottom uh, that is labeled thoracic level. That's the uh, numbered vertebrae, right? So in your thoracic of your thoracic vertebrae, you have 12 of them. And basically what they're looking at is comparing each vertebrae in the spinal column to all the rest in the spinal column. So if you look at Homo sapiens, that black line way at the top, you'll see how they all connect together in kind of this long kind of curve. And then if you look at chimpanzees, uh, that's the blue labeled pan, what you'll notice is it has kind of a similar curve and then raised end at either side just like the Homo sapiens curve does. So basically what this is telling us is that uh, there's a consistent pattern to how the facets of the thoracic vertebrae uh, change as you go down the spinal column. So what's interesting then is that we can look at fossil individuals where we have the different uh, thoracic vertebrae, right? And compare whether or not they kind of follow that curve roughly or not. So let's see, um, we have there uh, a couple different individuals. We have Dimenizi. Uh, those are represented by uh, some squares, some open squares, right, beneath Pan. And what you'll notice there is that the uh, third thoracic vertebrae from Dimenizi falls at uh, that particular site right there, about 17.5 on the axis on the left. And then over on the 11th thoracic vertebrae, it falls higher. And so it follows that trend from going uh, that curve upwards towards the end of the thoracic column. And we can see something similar with STS-14, where we also have an upward trajectory from the fifth thoracic up to the eighth thoracic. And then uh, over from the 10th to the 12th, we have it at a higher position than uh, the 5 through 8. But then you'll notice something interesting right here. So AL288, it's the uh, red uh, marked ovals. And what you'll see is that on the far right, the 10th and 11th thoracic vertebrae start high. And then you go down to the 6th thoracic vertebrae. But then check out the second. This is the one that uh, Johansson noticed something interesting about. And what you'll see is that you would expect, right, just like chimpanzees and, uh, and uh, Dimenizi and Homo sapiens, that it would plot higher up on the graph than that uh, sixth thoracic vertebrae. But instead, it actually falls 
lower than the sixth thoracic vertebrae in terms of articular facet width. And that is important because it doesn't follow the same trajectory. It falls so much lower that it doesn't appear to be in the same, you know, trajectory the as the other individuals would be in. So did we have the complete spinal column of, of AL288-1? We would expect that curve, but for some reason, that one particular stubborn vertebrae is falling out of line there. And there were also some interesting morphological features that we could note on the vertebrae as well. Uh, what you'll see here is, it might be kind of hard to see, but basically on the back of the vertebrae, leading up to the spinous process, which sticks basically off the back of the vertebrae, you have this region that is very triangular in this particular vertebrae. If you look at a homo sapiens vertebrae, basically there's a linear ridge going from the tip of the spinous process all the way basically to the vertebral canal in the middle of the vertebra. And that is not the case in this particular fossil. Instead, basically, that ridge stops and it kind of divides into two, making a triangular area. And interestingly, we don't see this in chimpanzees. We don't see in Homo erectus, gorillas, uh, or some of these other primate groups here. But what we do see it in is uh, papayo here, and also theropithecus, which is a genus of baboons. So that's particularly interesting, right? We have some different lines of evidence adding up here. First of all, we have that Johansson noticed that the vertebrae was preserved differently than any of the other fossils. Then we note that it falls out of line in terms of articular facet width on the trajectory that we would expect it to follow. And then third, we're also noticing that there's some pretty distinctive morphological features that we can see that don't quite line up with what we would expect. Here's a closer look at that particular vertebrae, this thoracic vertebrae, and I've kind of outlined that area in blue and white there. You can see how that ridge splits into this triangular section and doesn't continue projecting all the way to the vertebral canal as we would expect were it coming from an ape. And then there's also uh, this graph from that paper as well. Um, let's see here. This is a principal components analysis. So a PCA where they're basically looking at the surface of the vertebrae. And once again, what they're finding is that this vertebrae falls outside of the range of variation seen not only in humans, but also in chimpanzees. And we wouldn't really expect that given that this Lucy, right, is an ape, right? And so we wouldn't expect it to be falling outside of that range of variation, but it is. It's falling within the range of variation of Theropithecus gelda. So something is really off here, right? Because we have a lot of different problems here and things aren't adding up. So what is going on exactly? Well, the conclusion here is that this is indeed a vertebrae that does not belong to the Lucy skeleton. There's so many different lines of evidence here that add up that point away from this particular element belonging to the rest of the skeleton. And so really, you know, that is problematic if we were to try to argue that this <laughs> comes from Lucy because there's so many different things that just don't add up. So Overall, then, the scientific community has generally agreed that, you know, this particular vertebrae does not belong to the Lucy skeleton. So great, right? Science has worked. We found a skeleton. And in fact, it turned out that we had incorrectly included a vertebrae that did not belong. And now we've taken that vertebrae out of the skeleton because we've done very specific analyses and recognize that it does not fit. Well, great. The problem here is that some people want to go a lot further, and so far as to say that, for example, the pelvis or the femur don't actually belong to the Lucy skeleton as well. And that's really what I want to address here. Specifically, the pelvis and the sacrum is what I want to focus on. 
Because in my conversation with uh, Christopher Rupi, that was really what came up, right? Whether or not this pelvis could be discriminated from that of Homo sapiens. And also some others, people, some random people I've dealt with on the internet have tried to argue that the pelvis and the sacrum of Lucy really belonged to, you know, a Homo sapiens individual. So I want to talk about whether or not that is true. But what I want to point out here before we get there is something that's very important. If you want to make a case for the Lucy skeleton being chimeric, then you should follow the pattern of what other scientists did to prove that this vertebrae was out of line, right? They worked through it. They found these particular, uh, you know, anatomical regions where it differed. And they found that there was this unique preservation. And based off of that evidence, they proved it and people accepted it. So for those who want to argue that the Lucy skeleton is chimeric, they ought to follow a similar pattern, looking at a specific element of the anatomy and comparing it to other creatures and determining whether or not, you know, it falls within the range of variations seen in, in other apes or other members of Australopithecus afarensis. Now, before we get there, I wanted to mention something because Generally, okay, let's say we found one Theropithecus vertebrae, right? And a lot of people want to argue that the upper body of Lucy, with the rib cage, uh, the arms, for example, come from some other type of arboreal ape. And generally, then they want to, you know, say that you know it was some some ape-like creature that had those particular remains get mixed in with human remains. And I wanted to point out. Uh, that there's differences between all of Lucy's bones and those of Theropithecus, right? And so really, you know, Theropithecus, it is pretty distinctive. Here on the left, I've got some Theropithecus humeri. And what you can see here is that they're actually fairly different from that of Lucy's. I've got Lucy's uh, distal humerus depicted there. And what you'll see is that we have that intercondylar eminence uh, sticking out right there in basically in between the lateral and the medial epicondyle. And interestingly, that is something that is not pronounced in Theropithecus. And so basically my point there was just to say, you know, we could go through all of the different skeletal elements and talk about whether or not they match up with Theropithecus and, you know, they don't. Uh, we could look at it, but, you know, things like this have already been done. And we do understand that Lucy's bones actually do match those of humans better. But my point is simply that, you know, this then gets even more implausible, right? It's implausible enough, first of all, right, to say, well, you know, a significant portion of the skeleton comes from uh, Theropithecus, for example, right? But then to actually, you know, carry that through is, is even harder and you know these these parts of the skeleton it's very unlikely right first of all that you'd have a theropithecus mixed in but then we have to have another creature that's some type of extinct ape that we don't know about mixed in besides a theropithecus as well right and your comp your explanation has to get more and more complex so let's talk about the sacrum so here we've got three different uh sacral elements. We first got AL288-1, Lucy on the left here, then we've got a Homo sapiens sacrum, and then a chimpanzee sacrum on the right. And what you'll notice is that, unsurprisingly, Lucy's sacrum looks more like that of a human sacrum than a chimpanzee sacrum. Isn't that a shocker? Now, some people want to take this so far as to say, Lucy's sacrum looks like a human sacrum more than a chimpanzee sacrum. Therefore, it is a human sacrum. And that is a really, really bad line of argument. I mean, it's like saying a dolphin looks more like a whale than a pig. And therefore, okay, dolphins are whales. Okay, uh, let's say a blue whale. A dolphin looks more like a blue whale than it looks like a pig. And therefore, a dolphin is a blue whale. No, that's not how it works. You have to have very specific criterion to define a blue whale from a dolphin. And as you break down into smaller and smaller taxonomic boundaries, the details that you're looking at have to become more and more specific, right? And so because Australopithecus, you know, 
phylogenetically has been typically understood to be a sister group to Homo, we're at a small taxonomic boundary, right? These are two different genera. And so to distinguish them, we have to look at smaller differences than to distinguish, uh, for example, a dolphin from a pig, right? Because that is easier. Yeah, so that's really interesting. Uh, Cross-platform adventure says, huh, I never knew chimpanzee sacrums were that narrow. Yeah, so that's actually really cool. And um, there's so much I could say here. Uh, there's a couple differences anatomically that this has for a chimpanzee uh, pelvis. Uh, basically, what this means is that more of the sacrum articulates with the oscoxa, which is basically, right, uh, well, the iliac blade together with the other parts that form the bottom, right? So if you see there, the auricular surface is this area along the left uh, that basically sticks out, and that's how the sacrum attaches to the oscoxa. It's called the sacroiliac joint. And the chimpanzee has more of its vertebrae in contact with the uh, ilium than in a human. So in a human, I believe it's about three of the vertebrae come into contact, whereas in a chimpanzee, uh, more of them come into contact with that joint surface. And part of that is because the uh, part of that is because the chimpanzee ilium is very long. And so because the ilium itself is long, that means the sacrum needed to be long as well. And what you'll notice here, yeah, as Dapper Dinosaur points out, chimps aren't narrow, humans are thick. Yes, humans have a very thick, very bulky sacrum. And Lucy happens to look more like ours. Does this mean that Lucy is a human? No, because we can actually fairly easily distinguish between Lucy's sacrum and that of a human. Here's from the rear perspective. You can kind of see Lucy's sacrum compared to that of the Homo sapiens sacrum. So generally, why exactly does Lucy's sacrum look more like a human sacrum than it looks like a chimpanzee sacrum? Well, the reason is because anatomically, Lucy had a very similar mode of locomotion to our own. She was walking bipedally, and we walk bipedally. And because of that, we have very similar pelvic structure because that pelvic structure is just fairly ideal if you want to walk upright. It causes some problems when you get to childbirth and things like that, but it is a pretty good, a pretty good setup if you want to be walking on your hind legs. So some features which distinguish between the uh, the sacrum of Lucy and the human sacrum. One of these is the dorsal alar tubercles. They're basically these large bumps that stick out on the sacrum, and they're absent from uh, Lucy's kind, including on this specific fossil. There's no evidence of those dorsal alar tubercles. Uh, those are different from those spinous processes, or it's not the spinous process. It's the process that sticks up to articulate with uh, the, the vertebrae on top, the dorsal alar tubercles do not articulate with the, the lumbar vertebrae on top of this. So uh, the point being here that this is an example of a feature which we can see in Homo sapiens, we don't see in Lucy. And there's a lot of other different features in the sacrum as well that we'll get to in a minute. Generally here, uh, here's a comparison of the pelvis. I've got these pelvis uh, bones scaled basically to the correct uh, the, the correct size, which is, it's gorilla's pelvis is very impressive. They, gorillas are just massive animals. It's so crazy to have gorilla bones, which I don't have, but I got to research, I got to work on some recently, and it's really cool because of just how massive they are compared to all of the other apes that you deal with. And we have to also be careful about that because the massive size can also influence some of the you know, features of the bone actually as well, because uh, basically weight bearing and large size can affect how things work. And you also have to scale features down to understand how they work in relative size as well. But generally here, the thing that I don't want to point out is size as much as it is shape. What you'll notice is once again, that the human has a rather bulky shape compared to the chimpanzee, pan troglodytes, and gorilla, 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 which have very tall uh, pelvis. You can see there the ilium is extremely tall. Why is that? Well, it's because they're walking on their hind, well, no, 
It's because they're walking on all four legs, right? They're quadrupedal. And what that basically means is that they hang their guts from their pelvis as they walk, right? So their pelvis is basically oriented like this and their abdominal cavity is like this. And what that means then is that they have a broad uh, surface on their ilium to hang basically their intestines and everything from. Whereas we uh, humans and Lucy as well has more of a bowl shape and that's because we're walking upright. And so our guts basically hang down and rest on the floor of our pelvis rather than hanging from it. And so that's why there's a bit of difference there. And also chimpanzee pelvis forms more of kind of a longer shape once you put it all together and articulate it, whereas a human is much more kind of compact. Uh, and that probably does affect childbirth in, in chimpanzees and gorillas as well. It's probably quite a bit easier for chimpanzees and gorillas to give birth as compared to Homo sapiens or even Australopithecus afarensis. The point here is that Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy fossil, has a pelvis which looks a lot more like ours than it does like a, than a chimpanzee and a gorilla. But once again, superficial resemblance does not mean that it comes from the same species or even the same genus because homology exists. We have organisms all over that have features and basically we need to look at minutia to distinguish between bones. Here's an important feature which you can use to distinguish the pelvis of a homo from that of an australopithecine. And this is if you basically look at that hole there, that is the acetabulum. Uh, the acetabulum is this joint surface that's where your femur, that big bone in your uh, thigh, articulates with your pelvis. And what you can see there is there's that big hole. And basically, if you look at the pelvis and look straight at that hole, what you'll notice is that the, the iliac blade, this ilium, up here above that, that hole, that acetabulum, is oriented differently in a human and in an australopithecine. In a human, it's kind of more, uh, it's almost, uh, when you look at the acetabulum, you see more of the ilium. Whereas when you look at the acetabulum in an australopithecine, the ilium actually kind of lines up uh, being kind of perpendicular to the acetabulum. And this is actually the same thing that you see in chimpanzees. Unfortunately, I didn't have a picture of a chimpanzee to add here, but when you look at the acetabulum of a chimpanzee, the ilium actually lines up straight in front of it, being kind of perpendicular to it, just like in Australopithecus afarensis, which is really interesting, right? Why exactly is that? Well, it's because Lucy didn't walk exactly like we do either. She had uh, some ability probably in locomoting in ways that we don't typically do, and that influenced her bones, right? The point being here, once again, that we can draw... Uh, these comparisons, right, and see that Lucy's pelvis is once again distinct from that of a human. So just from the features that we've looked at so far, the challenge, right, for those who are arguing that Lucy is a chimera is to find any human pelvis from anywhere that when you look at the acetabulum has an ilium that's perpendicular to it, or to find a human anywhere that does not have a dorsal alar tubercle on its sacrum. Right. And so the problem here is that from the data that we do have, we know that Lucy has features that uh, we do not. And we have features that Lucy does not. And so we can't just equivocate them because they have a similar shape because they serve similar functions. All right. Here's a wonderful paper. Uh, Pelvic morphology and homo erectus and early homo. Uh, when we get into this paper, they have some drawings of reconstructions of the pelvis. And what you'll see here is we've got uh, A is afarensis. This is Lucy's pelvis specifically. Then we've got uh, this particular pelvis B from Homo erectus. Is that the Gona pelvis? I I'm, I'm, can't remember if that's the pelvis from the site of Gona or not. But then we have... Uh, 15,000 here, KNMW15,000, which is the Neriacotomy boy, a famous Homo erectus uh, from Neriacotomy in Kenya. And then finally, we've got D, a Homo sapiens pelvis. What you'll notice here is that there is a fair amount of variation uh, 
between these different pelvic remains. But that which is most stark is seen between Lucy and the modern human. Let's see. In this next slide, yeah, I blow it up here. Um, what you can see there is that Lucy's pelvis is very wide, uh, transverse from the medial to the lateral. It is super, super wide. And the human pelvis takes much more of kind of a rounded form, whereas her pelvis is more of an oval almost. And part of this is the result of iliac flaring. So iliac flaring is basically when your pelvis, uh, the blade of your ilium sticks further out and doesn't wrap around in uh, as like in a homo sapiens. As you can see in the homo sapiens diagram on the right, uh, you can see how the pelvis basically wraps around, whereas Lucy's pelvis goes way out to the side before wrapping around. And this is called iliac flaring. Sometimes you hear iliac flaring discussed as if there's modern people who have ilium that are flared to the extent seen in australopithecines, but that's actually not the case. Australopithecines have the most dramatic iliac flare of any hominin. And uh, homo pelvis do not have that particular feature. And once again, this is a feature where, you know, we can use it to distinguish between an australopithecus and a homo fossil. So this is a diagram uh, from that same paper. It, it might be fairly hard for you to see because uh, of how small it is. Um, but this is really helpful because it goes through a number of features of the ilium and of the sacrum, which can be used to distinguish an australopith pelvis from Homo erectus or from a modern human pelvis. And basically, uh, there's a lot of features here to go through, so I'm not going to be going through them tonight. But the gist of what I wanted to talk about is, let's see, uh, one thing here, uh, for example, retroauricular area. This is, once again, that area basically where the pelvis attaches to the sacrum. And Lucy has a very small uh, retroauricular area, whereas uh, both Homo erectus and modern humans have a very large one. Uh, the iliac tuberosity, sacroiliac joint surface. Uh, yeah, so the retroauricular area is like beyond the sacroiliac joint. So it's, it's a little different than the, than the sacroiliac joint size. Uh, but once again, they're both smaller in Lucy, whereas they're larger in Homo. And then we have also specific features which we can use to distinguish Australopithecines from Homo erectus that they share with modern humans or features that they share with modern humans that they don't share with Homo erectus. And all of these together, you know, indicate that we can pretty easily distinguish between a Homo pelvis and an Australopithecus pelvis. Uh, for example, your acetabular joint surface, small relative to body size, large relative to body size. Australopithecines have a very, very small acetabulum when you look at it. And Homo has, has one that even like compared to the size of the pelvis is, is super large. Uh, as I mentioned before, dorsal alar tubercles, they're either small or basically non-existent in Australopithecines, and then they're very large in Homo. Uh, and there's a lot of other interesting features here as well that we can use to distinguish. All of this comes to the conclusion that we can distinguish between the pelvis of an Australopithecine and that of a human. And this has come to the point then, well, if we can distinguish between Lucy's pelvis and those of all members of the genus Homo, why would we say that this pelvis came from a member of the genus Homo, right? No, it is clearly distinguished from them. And this is the problem of those who want to make the argument that Lucy is a chimera, right? Well, this pelvis came from a human. Well, if it came from a human, why does it have all these features that humans don't have? Then you have to just keep on continually expanding the definition of what uh, a Homo pelvis looks like to accommodate all of these bipedal australopithecines and possibly other bipedal apes that will be found in the future, right? Just to make your argument that australopithecines weren't walking upright. Here's another paper. This is a bit of a more statistical look at it. Uh, Pelvic Joint Scaling Relationships and Sacral Shape in Hominoid Primates. This is by Ingrid Lundin. Uh, she looked at some particular areas in regard 
to uh, joint surfaces in, in particular. Uh, they have, for example, they are the auricular surface area and the acetabular diameter, uh, sacral vertebral body area and the acetabular diameter. So basically what they're doing is they're comparing the joint surfaces. And what do you find? Uh, here are two particular graphs from the paper. And what you'll see is that we kind of get a rough sorting of the different taxa. We have uh, red representing Homo sapiens, I believe. Yes, Homo sapiens is red. And what you'll see is that Homo sapiens uh, is pretty far up on the regression. Uh, it clusters up there. And then, uh, let's see, uh, Australopithecus afarensis is the yellow circle. And what you see there, once again, is that it falls way down towards the bottom of the regression in the range of Pongo pygmaeus. So that's a species, of, sorry, of orangutan, actually. And then on the right here, we have, let's see, this is the SBA. What was that exactly? The SBA, sacral vertebral body area, uh, compared to the acetabular diameter. And once again, what you'll see is that that yellow circle representing Lucy falls down beneath the range of the Homo sapiens individuals. So we have, once again, this sorting out. We can use all of these specific criterion to define uh, Australopithecine pelvises, but then we can also look at kind of the um, statistical measures of the surface area of the joints, and we can also distinguish them. Here's another uh, graph from that same paper. This is interesting. Uh, so on the left, you have kind of a cluster, kind of a rainbow there of different primate species, and then that red uh, linear uh, trajectory is that of Lucy. And then you have to the right of that a slight pink and blue, and those are Homo sapiens, uh, male and female, respectively. So what is this measuring? Uh, this is measuring the interspecific comparison of sacral vertebral elements divided by sacral length. So basically, you're comparing uh, each of these elements to the length of the the whole sacrum, and what you'll find here is that there are some different patterns, right? So a lot of these gorillas, hylobates, uh, pongo pygmaeus, orangutans, all follow a pretty similar trajectory. Uh, and what is that trajectory? That is that they have a, a small ratio, uh, basically, in comparison to humans who tend to have, uh, tend to have it would be, let's see, it would be larger vertebral elements. Um, but what you see there is there's kind of two different trends. And then what you see is that Lucy actually kind of bridges that, right? So when we go down to her fifth sacral element, it kind of begins right around the same position as all of the other vertebral elements, uh, the fifth vertebral elements from all of those other uh, arboreal apes. But then as we get higher into the... Uh, sacrum, what we'll see is that the vertebral elements begin to look more like that of Homo in terms of this index, and they begin to line up more with Homo sapiens, which is interesting. So the top of the sacrum tends to look more like Homo, and as we go down to the bottom, it begins to look more like that of arboreal apes. And they wrote about this in their paper. Here's a long quote. Um, the important thing here that they said is that um, assuming the relative width of the caudal sacral elements relates to the size and strength of the piriformis muscle, it would be expected that bipedal primates would have wide caudal sacral elements and arboreal quadrupedal primates would have narrow caudal sacral elements. And they talk about how this was confirmed by that. And they say the uh, sacral four of AL288-1 is intermediate to these two groups. This would imply that AL288-1, Lucy, did not yet possess the derived bipedal condi condition of having a short lever arm associated with the piriformis muscle, or perhaps lacked the need for the stabilizing action of the piriformis. Which is interesting, right, that we have, apparently, it seems, a possible loss of this muscle, because it wasn't needed given the pelvic configuration that we had in the Australopithecines. Another thing which I've heard before is people trying to claim that other particular elements follow, you know, well, her jaw is human and her skull is that of some arboreal ape. Uh, 
wanted to touch on this a moment just because I found that to be a particularly egregious argument. Uh, if you look at the mandibles once again, what you'll see here is that Lucy's mandible looks more like that of a human mandible than a chimpanzee mandible because Lucy overall is more similar to a human than a chimpanzee is. Oh, but however, once again, there are criteria that we can use to pretty reliably distinguish between an Australopithecus afarensis mandible and that of a human. Uh, one of those is the shape. You can see there, uh, Lucy and modern humans are described as having a kind of a V shape compared to a chimpanzee having a U shape. Maybe you can kind of see it there. But really, even Lucy has even kind of more of a V shape than the modern human, which kind of has a nice parabola there where Lucy's tends to be more narrow in the front and then wider at the back to kind of a, a more extreme degree. And there's also features such as, you know, the various proportions of the teeth. If you look at her molars, they're quite different from ours in size and in morphology. Uh, and, and there's all sorts of features, including the chin, of course, that we could use to distinguish between Lucy's jaw and ours. But generally, you know, the point here being that, no, once again, even these parts that tend to look more like Homo, we can sufficiently distinguish between them and us. And then this is kind of the, the point that I wanted to kind of end on because we've been talking about Lucy in kind of an abstract, itemized way, right? Focusing on this one particular skeleton. But really, what's better for us to do is to step back a minute from looking at Lucy. You know, we've gone through these particular indices and features that we could use to distinguish Lucy from uh, Homo sapiens. But really, what we should see is uh, that Lucy lines up with other members of her genus, Australopithecus. And unsurprisingly, that is actually what we find. Uh, on the left, we've got KSDVP-1. That's the skeleton called Catanumo. Then we've got Lucy and then Littlefoot, SDW-431. SDS-14, and then MH1 and MH2, the Sediba individuals, which, you know, I'm going to bring in system question whether or not they are Australopithecine or not, but for the purposes, we'll just uh, call them Australopithecines because that is the general anthropological view. The point being here that morphology is somewhat consistent in regards to the pelvis and the sacrum. When we look at these different creatures, what we end up seeing is that they actually all have pretty similar uh, pelvis remains and also the sacrum. And maybe that's actually an argument against Australopithecus sediba being a human. And I think that is certainly uh, something to be considered, right? Whether the postcranium means that sediba is not a human after all. Um, but as I said before, when we stop looking at Lucy in such an itemized, individualized way, what we see is that her morphology actually fits in pretty well into the spectrum of other Australopithecines. And they all can be characterized by these traits as we that we talked about before, having that uh, ilium that is perpendicular to the sacrum, or sorry, to the acetabulum, uh, lack of that dorsal alar tubercle, and going into all of those kind of minutia that we talked about. The point of this all being that Lucy can pretty reliably be argued, is not a chimera. The criterion which we use to find that that one particular vertebrae actually came from the genus Theropithecus failed to actually distinguish any other bone in her body uh, as being somehow unique or standing out in any way. And so really, this is not a very good argument to argue that Lucy is a chimera. Going beyond this, then, is kind of the question, is the species Australopithecus afarensis a chimera? And that is a bit of a broader question, and I think somewhat of a more legitimate one, though I would argue that it's not. But once again, species are made up, right? So, you know, we're talking about a specific amount of variation, but the important thing here for us really is whether Australopithecus afarensis is a mix of human and non-human bones, and that is what I would disagree with. You know, you know, is it possible that we could be including two different Australopithecine species? Maybe, but I would argue that it's not a mixture of human and non-human bones at the very least, and probably take us 
a pretty strong stand against it being different Australopithecine species as well. But that is really the more substantive topic of debate here, rather than whether or not Lucy herself is chimeric, because we have very good evidence that her bones just don't line up with any other creatures in particular. So overall, that's kind of what I had prepared for tonight. If you've got any questions or comments, throw those in the chat, and I would love to uh, respond or talk about them a little bit. And uh, generally, I want to make the main point once again that science uh, and the science of origins in regards to Lucy isn't about deceiving people into thinking that Lucy is, you know, somehow, you know, this ape man and they're going to cover up evidence about, you know, this mixture of human and ape bones. No, in fact, scientists are diligently looking, trying to understand whether or not this is indeed a mixture, right? And they've tried and looked at these different parts, and that's how they recognize that that one particular thoracic vertebrae was out of place, right? So the point is that in paleoanthropology especially, scientists are actually very, very critical of one another. And so this isn't like some conspiracy or cover-up job. This isn't about deceiving people, as Bubblegum Gun would like to say. Uh, this is about trying to come to a better understanding of the fossils. They say they tried to deceive it. It failed. They didn't, because the scientists who uh, did that paper, right, talking about that thoracic vertebrae not belonging to the rest of the skeleton, they were secular scientists as well. So how exactly were they trying to deceive people? It is interview me. So, well, maybe sometime we'll have to talk, Bubblegum Gun. You can, of course, email me on the About page of my channel. You can find my email address there, and I'd certainly be willing to uh, have a discussion with you sometime about Lucy if you would like to do that. And we can certainly talk about whether or not Lucy is a conspiracy or not. So feel free to go to the About page of my channel, and uh, you can find my email address there. I'd love to hear from you. And maybe we could do a live stream or a private chat if you'd like. Uh, but anyway, that's all I've got for tonight, folks. Thank you all for joining me. I hope you had a wonderful time and uh, blessings to you all.